because I think you don't have a real background in molecular tools so far. But then also we're going to dive into basically the, the small details of DNA metabarcode and because that's really what is, in my opinion, kind of important because many people are overlooking that. And then we also talk about the potential, of course, for monitoring of macroinvertebrates. And um, yeah, then I'm happy to take any questions. But feel free to stop me anytime, right? right. So let's quickly talk about why we are doing um, water quality assessment. So you probably have heard some, some talks from Jay about multiple stressors. And that's a good start to get into why we do assessment. So we basically, by human activity, we stress our ecosystems quite a bit. And this leads to degradation of ecosystems. And basically, ecosystem services can't function properly. So what we really have to do is we have to restore our freshwater ecosystems and we have to protect them. However, we have to, for doing that, we have to really figure out what is the state of the ecosystems. And for that, of course, we want to assess the water quality. So here, for example, you see me on the side when I did a project with Jay with his three maser cousins looking at multiple stressors on, on freshwater ecosystems. So we have macroinvertebrates in those channels and you kind of want to identify them. And at the moment, this is done basically with morphology. So if we look at morphological identification, probably have looked at some macroinvertebrates yourself. It's quite difficult to identify those larvae. So the method is well established, but it's often not very accurate. We don't get them to species level, but we only need like a microscope to look at the specimen. So it's very easy to do. And it's a useful system for stream management and assessment because this is basically done all over the world at the moment. The question is really, can we do this better and can we do it cheaper? And this is where DNA meta barcoding comes in. So basically what you do, you take your kick sample, put all your specimens you collect in a blender, take the DNA out, and then with PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction, so basically you're going to copy your DNA, you can then copy a barcoding fragment and put this on a sequencer and with a reference database, you can identify your taxa. So we're going to talk about this now in a bit more detail to make clear how that works. But um, just up front, this really increases species resolution quite a bit because we can identify the imaginis on species level. And also we detect more taxa and it's more reproducible because here we have this human bias, which might um, lead to different identification results depending on experience. So basically we could say both methods can be used for stream quality assessment. And even though this one, the meta barcoding method is more accurate, the morphology based identifications, they are used today and they're often also good enough. So the really the big question is actually, can meta barcoding be cheaper than the morphological identifications? But also if you are interested in some ecological questions and other things, being the meta barcoding can be really good use to um, to also get you a higher resolution, which is often very important for scientific questions. Where it's not about monitoring, but we're looking at most taxa in the ecosystem, how they respond to stressors and those things. So it's not only a tool for water quality assessment, but also really for, for research as well. So let's quickly talk about what DNA is. So you see here, you see me here in standing in next to a stream. In America and really DNA is the blueprint of life. So all living organisms contain DNA, so each cell. And this means that DNA is present in all places in the environment. And we see it here, it can be in mitochondria and also in the nuclear gene. And it's basically a four letter code. So for me, I don't even look at the molecules anymore because I work with sequencing, a lot of bioinformatics. I just basically look at those four letters and this for me is DNA. So if we say blueprint, it's not really true because it's actually quite a big book for each species. So it's, it's millions of letters you have in one genome, which make up the, the blueprint, how to build this organism. Basically it's phenotype, how it looks and how it works. And this is coded in the DNA. That also means that our species look different. And of course they're different species. That means they have, different genetic blueprints. So that means that there is difference between those taxa and we can use those differences to identify the different taxa. And the good thing with DNA for macroinvertebrates is that for larvae, for example, for chironomids, they are very difficult to identify. But if we take the imaginings, those can be identified by experts 
And then we can use it because the, the larvae have DNA and also if you have some legs or wings of an insect, those also contain DNA, we can use those to identify the different taxa. So it doesn't matter which larval state you have, as long as you have the organism in the reference database, you can identify it. So this technique is called DNA barcoding and it's based on the standardized gene, gene section that was developed by Paul de Boer in 2003. And already 150 base pairs are sufficient to identify most taxa. So you can imagine this like a book, we could sequence this whole genome, those millions of base pairs, but it's much more easier to just take one page out of the book and use that for species identification. So we want to copy basically one page and there we need something called primers. So we basically choose the same gene region for all organisms. It's like a barcode in the supermarket on a product. And instead of reading the whole book, we take the first sentence of a paragraph and the last sentence of a paragraph. Those are basically the, your, this is called primers. And in, in reality, what you do is you basically synthesize in DNA the first paragraph and the, uh, sorry, the first sentence of the paragraph and the last sentence of the paragraph. And then what you can do is you can copy just this one paragraph or page in your book, which makes it a lot cheaper because you don't have to sequence the whole genome. You just have to sequence, let's say, a 400 base per region. This is typically done. And what you have then is that within the species, the genetic similarity is around zero to one percent. And then to other species, you see there is this gap where between species, there is a two percent or higher genetic difference. So this is generalized, there are exceptions, but in most cases, this is the case. And this is, can be done, this can be used to identify species. So now the big question is which book page of this book are we using because there are different markers available. And we talked about that there is this nuclear genome and also mitochondria. Mitochondria is the kind of the powerhouse of the cell. Those are small cell components. And in here they have their own genomes and they're quite tiny. But the advantage here is that they are present in several copies, often in hundreds of thousand copies in your cell. So that means that this genome basically is copied a few thousand times per individual cell, whereas the normal genome, the nuclear genome only, is, copy, is present in two copies. This means if we target those mitochondria, you have the advantage that if we take a gene from this genome here, from the small mitochondrial genome, that we get a lot of copies and then can easily, more easily amplify this gene. And also it's not affected by recombination, which means that you have crossing over and genes are exchanged between organisms. So this means that the evolution of this, or, of this genome is quite stable. The big question here is which, which gene to choose. And the community has decided to use um, cytochrome oxidase subunit one because it has a good taxonomic resolution for animals. And we look at macroinvertebrates, so this is basically just true for, for animals. So if you go for plants or fungi, you would use another marker. However, and there, this is kind of important. Some other people, they say, well, this gene is highly variable. So it's very difficult to create those primers to copy this one paragraph of your book. So they recommend to use another marker which are ribosomal markers. And while it's true that, it's, um, that primers are easier to, to design for those regions because they have conserved regions, it's, the issue here is that we don't have really reference databases. So for C1, we have over 5 million C1 references. And for ribosomal genes, we don't have too many. So it's kind, of, it's kind of tricky because most people jump on C1, which I think is a very good choice. And there's a few people who really like ribosomal markers, but they don't really have the reference databases. And also it's questionable if the resolution of this marker is, is good enough, and especially if you design good primers, and we're going to talk about this a bit as well, it's no problem to, um, to make good, good primers for, for, this, for the CO1 marker. So if you want to apply this method and, or you read about it, try to focus on CO1 and take the, those guys with a sort of grain which tell you about ribosomal markers. This is, this is an opinion some people have, but it's typically not where the community as a whole is going. So let's quickly talk about um, DNA meter barcoding. And I really want to make clear that it's not too, too complicated. It's basically you take your sample 
And what you do, you dry it and you grind it up. This can be done with a mortar or a kitchen blender. And then you extract the DNA. This is basically, you can do most of the things in your kitchen is you can just use salt, a detergent like a dish soap and um, ethanol to extract your DNA. And then you need a bit of more advanced stuff, which is your polymerase. So this is basically copying the targeted fragment of your DNA. And then with heating and cooling, you basically copy this one fragment and then you can sequence this and there's machines available which can basically sequence millions of sequences which enables this DNA meta barcoding. So what you have basically is your, your bulk samples with hundreds of specimens and then in your DNA, all of your specimens will be represented and then we copy this barcode here. So it's a bit like scanning a product in a supermarket, but you're not going to scan each product one by one, but you scan the whole shopping cart at once. The method works really well. The problem here at the moment is really that the method isn't really well calibrated. So there is not a lot of validation going on because everybody jumps on this method and tries to use it for ecological questions, but nobody looks at the biases because nobody has time in science anymore to do those things. And um, that can lead to quite some problems. And this is also what I did do in, in the last few years. So basically, the issue here is that like meta barcoding sounds like a good idea, right? You can just grind up your sample, take, take it to, to a lab, sequence your one barcoding gene, and then you get a taxa list with all what is in your sample and you can do your water quality assessment. The issue really here is that within the scientific community, of course, you have people with personal agendas or even a company behind it. And so there is no consensus on the details on this method. So, the method is clear, but then there is no consensus on the small little details on the methods. For example, which barcoding gene to use? I told you about those people who want to use ribosomal markers instead of CO1. So that's quite quite tricky because it kind of makes, makes the life of, of us with CO1 a bit more difficult because we have to always fight those people with 16S and as they have maybe sometimes a company behind them, they really don't want to give up because they created the reference database for 16S and they want to push, push that into, into practice, which in my opinion isn't really useful. The same thing is you can filter DNA from water. So your organisms in the water, they give up of DNA and we could filter the water to capture those small DNA fragments. And we don't have to go out and take the kick sample. You can just take a water sample and then it makes sample really brilliant and easy. But the issue is why that sounds really good in practice. Like, it's not really working well for microinvertebrates because you have small, more, like this works really well for invasives or rare species that are especially big and slimy because like fish or, or like some frogs, they give up a, up a lot of slime and they have a big biomass. So they give off a lot of DNA into the water and a lot of cells and then can be easily captured with, with markers. But for those tiny microinvertebrates, they are very difficult to detect reliably with, with those DNA from water. And there are some people pushing this method, but um, at least for water quality assessment, I don't think that it's very useful. So really what we should be looking at is what are the problems at the moment, what are the biases, and also of course, what are the potential solutions? So there I look basically at a few different things during my PhD. And this is first of all, primer bias, where you have issues that you have this paragraph in your book, but then those, those um, taxa, they have different, they have variability across the gene. And so that means that your, your paragraph doesn't match all the books in your shelf, right? And so what you have to do is you have to figure out, does that make any problems with copying this DNA fragment or not? Then of course we have biomass, where small specimens have much less DNA, contain much less DNA because they have more le less biomass. And if you have a big specimen, let's say like, like this size, maybe like a few centimeters, and it's just one with, has a few millimeters and extract them together in a bulk sample, you might lose the small specimens because they just have less biomass and less DNA. So this can also bias your results. Of course, we need a reference database and the reference database should be complete. So I can only identify things if I have some reference database. And also the really big question, and this I, I only realized recently is really cost. Like the sequencing one in the lab run maybe just cost like a few hundred euros, but there is no point in using this method if morphological identification 
can do the same job, not on the same resolution, but still get you to assessment results, maybe just for 100 euros. So really, this is in the end because we want to put this into practice in an economic, economical focused world has to be at least the same price or cheaper. It doesn't really matter if the method is better, it has to be cheaper to be used in practice, at least for monitoring. But this hopefully will develop over time when sequencing costs decline. So let's um, quickly talk about um, what we should do. So let's not just jump out and use this method for water quality assessment. Let's really take a look and see what problems we might encounter. So here, the first idea is that we have a bit of primer bias because of those variabilities in the primer binding sites. So this paragraph in your book. And this also means that if the primer doesn't match all that well, not all taxa can be detected. And also, you probably don't get absolute abundance of your taxa. So this is done at the moment that you have count data, but we can't really provide that with meta coding, as I will show you in the next slides. So I started testing this with controlled experiments. So what I took was basically EPT taxon, 52 of those, and um, took basically from those a small bit of tissue, so roughly the same amount of tissue of each of those taxa, and did this with 10 different um, specimens for each taxon. So what I have, what I end up with is 10 mock communities, each containing 52 assessment relevant taxa with the same amount of tissue in it. So what I would expect is that we have here on this axis, the relative sequence abundance, this is the logarithmic axis, and here our 52 taxa, and what we can see here in red is that sometimes you miss the taxon completely. It doesn't get detected. And also for the other taxa, you get quite some variability. So sometimes you get, get around 10% of the reads for one taxon, and other times you just get 0.01%. So there is clearly a huge bias in this, which is caused by your primers, which are used to copy this one barcoding gene. And many people don't look at this. They just use the primers and they're like, or oh, this is from the literature, it has to be good, it's probably tested, someone checked it, but actually not many people check this. So this is really quite a critical issue because if you lose at this stage 30% of your tax in your sample, that's um, not really good for, for getting a good databases and doing assessment. It might still work, you might still get your few EPT tags that will tell you you have good water quality, but if we do this method, of course, you want to get it as good as possible and get it right. So this primer bias, because it, it skews the abundance of your taxa by around three to four magnitudes, and also you have the biomass issue, means that you cannot get the absolute abundance of your taxa. So that's really important to, to keep in mind. Also, of course, some, some taxa might, get, might remain undetected. So what I then did was I checked some primers for the literature, and um, you can see here a plot. Those are 15 important groups for freshwater monitoring. And you can see with the colors, here's variability. Those are your four letters. And what you see is that you get quite a lot of variability between your groups and also between different taxa. So basically, in, in this group here, in this Procoptera group, here there are hidden in it the data of around 900 different taxa. And this is basically the, the consensus and shows you the variability. So if there's a green, this, this is here completely green. This means this is all a T. And this is here blue and green. That means here is the variability, which is used to, to distinguish between different taxa. So if you take a whole, like let's say, 200 base per region of this. But this also means that your primer, so those are the letters, to find your paragraph in the book, they do mismatch. And as I showed you on the slide before, that's an issue because you get this primer bias. So what to do about this then? And um, the solution is, maybe I go back one second, to introduce primers which have variability. So they have a C or a T here. And this means that they match this variable position better. So it's kind of putting, putting variability in your primers to match the variability of the gene region we want to amplify. And this actually works quite well. So we see here a few primer sets which, um, have this variability, and we see the same plots from before. You see here with the normal standard primers, 
that some people are using, you get this variability in your amplification, you get this bias, and you can not get rid of it, but you can reduce it quite a bit. So you see with this BF2, BR2 primer, this variability is quite reduced, and it's all around the, the same abundance roughly. So this means if you design good primers, you can very well use C1 excellently for doing meta barcoding, but you have to do this, and you have to validate your primers. That's really important. And if, if you read about 16S, if people, if you want to use meta barcoding at some point, or you have some lab trying to use it for you, if you, if you say, please do some monitoring for us, and they come around for 16S, probably ask them about C1, because 16S, of course, because the binding sites are more conserved, has less bias, but it's still, most of the cases, worse off, and you don't have good reference databases in most cases. So it's really taking good primers for C1, in my opinion, is the way to go here. The next issue, let's talk about um, biomass, is that you have different, the organisms have different sites. So there is this thing where a few big specimens can really dominate your data set. And the solution around that is to basically sort your samples. So we sort them into specimen size. And then the big specimens, we only take a bit of tissue when we, once we grind them up and pool them in a way that the small specimens are a bit stronger represented when you pull your tissue together. And what that leads to is that you basically detect more taxa because you don't lose all your small specimens. And it also means you can sequence less because you have more equally pooled the specimens in your sample. So we can see this here in green. We have the original community composition. So we see in green, the spa is small specimens. And if you don't do sorting, you have the large specimens are just a few, but they still dominate your data set. So this is without, with, with no sorting. But if you sort this proportionally, you and then sequence with a normal meta barcoding approach, you get the small taxa much more equally re represented than they are in the original community. Also, the next, the third big problem is reference databases. So I can only, I, if I do meta barcode, I get back a lot of sequences, but I can only identify them if I have any reference data. So um, we see here that in green, those are good, good matches with the reference database. And this is also logarithmic. Yes. And so for the good, uh, we have a good coverage for the common tax in your sample and not so many for the rare taxa in your sample. So basically, what we have is we, we're building up those reference databases and for macroinvertebrates, at least in Europe, they are already quite well developed. So I'm pretty sure you can identify around 90% or around 90% of your taxa in most samples. So there's a lot of work ahead of us, but um, it actually works quite, quite well. And it's, it's not that huge of an issue currently. So now we have done all this validation and um, it's now time to, as we have validated the protocol very well, to really put this into practice. And together with partners from Finland, we looked at uh, macroinvertebrate samples from the actual Finnish monitoring program. And those were identified by experts in Finland who do the routine monitoring based on morphology and then compared with different primer sets and our meta barcoding approach. So you can see here on the map, the different samples, so it were indeed samples, and we have around 1 million sequences and two replicates for, for each sample, so each sampling location. Also, as I told you before, the, the cost of this method is not super high, so it's around 180 euros per sample, but still it requires that the samples are sorted. We cannot just blend the whole specimen with all the stone and leaves. So there is still a component in the cost taking the sample and sorting it. So we, we, at the moment, we basically just replace edification step of this method. And there the question is really is 180 euros. This is without any lab work. So this is, I mean, this is a lab work, but not without any employment. So this is just the material cost and the cost of sequencing. If you have the lab facilities and the person doing it, you probably end up with around 500 euro per sample. So this is, this is a good price, but it's not exactly competitive to, to at least to some monitoring offices, which do the, do the monitoring based on morphology. But anyway, we wanted to compare both methods with each other. So with a real, real world sample, and you see here 
This is basically the kick sample from Finland, one of those kick samples, and those are dried overnight and then basically pooled together and grinded up, DNA extracted into barcoding, fragment amplified, and then with some bioinformatics, we get our taxa list. And what do we find with, um, with morphology and DNA? First of all, we find that morphology only identifies half as much taxa as meta barcoding does. So if we look at the different samples here, on this plot, and here's the number of taxa in each sample, we can see that with morphology, those are the black dots, we always identify less taxa than with DNA meta barcoding. Sometimes it's very close, but often it's around, so it's in the in average, it's around 50 to 60% more taxa detected than with morphology. And also the taxonomic resolution is a bit better with meta barcoding, so you get more taxa on species level because you are able to identify the imaginase which are easy to, like not, uh, not easy, but more, more reliable to identify. Like for example, for chironomids, you can bring tax to species level, and those can be deposited in the reference database. And then with, with the DNA we find in our samples, we can reassign those reads to those chironomid species, where with morphology, we only get maybe to the family of chironomids. However, the big issue here is that if you look at the samples, we look at the, how much tax are detected between morphology and DNA meta barcoding, we also see that around 30% of taxa are detected with morphology, but not with DNA meta barcoding. So we really have to say meta barcoding isn't perfect. There are still some issues with this method, and we probably also won't get rid of those issues. So the big question is, what is the, what is the reason for that? And those are the, the factors currently limiting DNA meta barcoding. So to, to quickly recap, some of the things I already talked about, but we have the morphology side of things in the reference database and also the laboratory protocols. So let's quickly recap. We have the issue that we can overlook taxa if we sort our samples. So if we sort the kick samples, some small taxa can get overlooked. And here, this also affects DNA meta barcode because we still include this sorting step. Then of course, we have misidentification. But this not only is an issue for morphological identification, so I think the samples here were very well identified based on morphology, but also can be an issue with the reference database. If I put something in the reference database and it's wrong identified, I will also have the wrong species assigned if I use this reference data for my meta barcoding sequences. Also, we of course have gaps in the database, so some taxa might not be in the database and don't get detected. And the issue here is also that we lose taxonomic expertise. So we lose experts who are able to identify those taxa. So that makes it really difficult to complete those reference databases at the moment because nobody cares. It's the, not nobody, but like many people don't care about morphology. And that's quite a big issue because I think morphology is important. It's important to describe those different species and to, to fill those reference databases. So I think if morphologists work together with molecular people like, like me, we can really, like both sides can profit quite a lot because this, this reference database completion and description of new species as well is quite, is quite important. Then we talked about the difference in biomass. So we have small specimens which um, might remain undetected if we don't sort our samples and we have like high differences in biomass in the sample. And also we have this issue with primer bias, but here we can kind of solve this a little bit by developing better primers, so better for starting and end uh, sentence for our paragraph we want to copy in this book. However, estimation of biomass will still not be possible because there is still this bias in the orders of one to two magnitudes. So you won't get rid of that. Also, one more tech, the few more technical aspects is that we get inhibition. So this copying of this barcoding fragment doesn't always work well. If you have in inhibitors in, in the DNA extraction, which can be like some, some introduced by some minerals or humic acids, stuff, stuff like this. And also, it would, be, it would be nice if we could extract the whole kick sample and you wouldn't have to sort so all, this, so all, those, so all the leaves and gravel from collecting the sample but that's, um, that's at the moment still not possible. Also, we really have the issue that we have lots of different protocols at the moment, 
and um, maybe even some more biases we haven't really looked at yet. So we really have to make sure that this molecular method works really well before we use it in uh, routine monitoring. But in principle, it can be very well used. So if we take the, the data from the Finland samples, what we see here is the, the, indice, the assessment indices calculated with DNA and with morphological data, and those four indices are the indices used in Finland, and we see that the assessment results are quite similar between morphology and DNA-based metabar coding. So this means that we can intercalibrate those methods quite well. Also, it's maybe possible to get rough biomass estimates, but it's, it's not very precise. So here we see the amount of sequences we obtain for each, um, each species, and this is a, a species count. And we see, we would expect a one-to-one -one relationship here, but we can see that we have the issue that there is quite a lot of scheduling. So this is basically mainly prior bias, where it's not possible to, to get very precise estimation of, um, of biomass. And also here, this is just species counts. So those might have different biomass as well, which is not accounted in for here. So it's, you, get, you can get rough estimates of biomass, but you, you will, won't be able to get abundance. So it's not, it's not super precise. But then for assessment, you see that some, some of those assessment indices are based on presence absence data anyway. And I think this is what metabar coding can provide really well. And um, what is useful for, or what can be used in practice for doing assessment. This also means that we should think about, if you look at assessment, if you should maybe change the way we calculate our assessment indices. So if we now can get much higher resolution with the meta bar coding, we could really take advantage of that and actually make better water quality assessments, especially if we are able, for example, to identify all the chironomids now, we can go ahead and if we figure out the ecological indication of those different species. So what, is, what stressors affect different chironomid species in different ways, we could make the assessment quite a bit more precise. And this is what we are looking at at the moment to really put this meta bar coding method into practice with a big um, European project, uh, Dean Aquanet, where also Jay is involved, but also like lots of other people from Europe, from pretty much uh, all countries in Europe, which really sit, it's basically a lot of scientists sitting together and meeting and discussing really what the small details of this method and how to put this into practice for water quality assessment. So we, we talked a bit about, um, so this is by meta bar coding. In a nutshell, what we can use it for, we have some issues still, but the method works really well and it can provide quite some, some good taxonomic resolution. In, in my opinion, can be used for, for water quality assessment, but the issue is here is at the moment is really cost. However, like it's genetic data and we are able to, with this genetic data, get actually quite a bit of higher resolution with it. So, Every, every specimen has its, can have a unique haplotype, which is just like an individual sequence. And it's a, a little bit like a fingerprint. And with this method, because of genetic data, we can also assess genetic diversity. So I'm quickly, just in the last few minutes of this talk, I'm going to talk about some, some potentials and some stuff we might be able to do in the future with this data. So genetic diversity, we have here, I hope you can see this, those are like different specimens of one single stonefly, and all those of those have a unique haplotype. So each can be identified by a unique sequence. So the sequences are very similar. So they're around this 1% sequence range within a species, but all can have a few base pairs differences to each other. And what we can do is we can basically assign those, um, you have here those different haplotypes. And if we sequence this, this is shown for, for this mock sample here. This was just for testing. We have here the sequence abundance and here's biomass. And you can see that we can find those individual sequences back in our data set and we can really um, assign them again. We have some noise, so some sequencing errors here, but with some, some very um, strict filtering of the data, we are basically able to extract those individual sequences from your meta barcoding data sets. So what does it mean? It's a moment, oh sorry, this is still in German. My, my mistake. But um, um, so what we have here, I just quickly translate this. 
is family, so if you look at taxonomic resolution, it's family, genus, species, and then we have OTUs, which is what we have currently in meta barcoding. But we can also go, go to a finer resolution, which is basically the individual sequences of those specimens. And this means that we can actually do something really cool. And this is doing population genetics with DNA meta barcoding. So it's not, it's not really population genetics because it's, it's very crude data and it's, it, we have to apply a lot of filtering. But what you can do is you can get your, your, your sample, you grind it up, you do your meta barcoding, and then with your meta barcoding data set, you can basically take a look at genetic diversity of everything you have in your meta barcoding data set. So I have done this for the Finland data here, and just as an example, and what you can see is that, for example, here for the stone flying, or also for this um, Tychoptera, that taxa in the north, far up in the north of Finland, have another genetic um, fingerprint than the one down here. So this, this green here is a different sequence and has one, one base per difference to the, to the red haplotype, for example. And you see there is some structure going on. I mean, not, not always. This beetle here, for example, has, has not, a not high genetic diversity, but sometimes we can figure out, okay, there might be some, some population structure. So what does it mean? It means that maybe this taxon here is not very good in this person, because if it would be, it would be, would be much more equally distributed. So this can help us if we, if we get to this genetic diversity to, to kind of estimate in a way the dispersal potential of our macroinvertebrates on a whole community level. And this is really important to, for example, if we restore a river ecosystem, the big, big, big question is can, can our taxa reach this new ecosystem, right? And then we can figure out those things with, um, with this method. So there's quite a lot of potential in this genetic data. And just imagine we use this method across Europe with let's say 10,000 sample sites each year to do the routine monitoring, you would get absolutely amazing and very precise distribution maps of all your aquatic taxa you're interested in, as well as genetic diversity. So that's, um, that's kind of my dream at the moment to, to get there. And this is hopefully an outcome of the Aquanet. Um, maybe I have just a quick word on bioinformatics because that's quite uh, quite tricky as well. And I'm, I'm not going to go into detail too much about it because for, for you guys at practice, it's, um, it will work quite easily because what we should do um, is that we basically just upload the, the meta barcoding data, the raw sequence data, because those are millions of sequences. We just upload them in the cloud because in the cloud, those can be analyzed by automated pipelines. So they're quite, quite, delicate and complicated, but you don't have to worry about that too much. And if you have the data in the cloud, you can also, also have this data on, in one spot. And this means it's also accessible for everybody as well. So if this is done right, it not only could help water quality assessment, but also it could be amazing for ecological research because it, you get like your species distribution modeling and GPS, like your distribution maps. And as I talked about also, your population genetics maps, where you can basically estimate the um, potential of recolonization and things like that. So that's, that's still a, far, a, bit, a bit far in the future, but this is hopefully where it's going um, with this method. Also, when talking about the future, it's, it's just a small detail. We talked about um, the sequencing part and the lab, lab work and where we have to copy our small paragraph in the book, right? We do this with the polymerase chain reaction and we have those primer biases here. This means we can't get abundance and we are missing taxa. The big question is, is there a better way of doing this? And the answer to that, it's, it's yes. We could actually just take the whole genome, the whole book, and basically just sequence all of it. And we're not doing it at the moment because it's super expensive. But the thing is that sequencing costs are rapidly declining every, every year. The, the sequencing costs are less and less. So let's say in a few years, you probably will be able to just skip this whole meta barcode method actually, and just go with direct sequencing. So this will be PCR free, and with that have less bias. The thing here is that we need another type of reference. So we, instead of just taking a, a, a small marker, which is around 600 base plus long, you would take the whole mitochondrial genome, which would be 16,000 base per long. But this reference database is so far don't exist, 
but I can, um, I'm quite sure that this is basically the future where we, at some point, it's just going to be so cheap from the sequencing that we're going to, to, to skip this PCR step and go to whole genome sequencing in the end, which gives, should give us even, even better data. That is kind of an, kind of an issue for, for routine monitoring because it also means that we have to standardize. If, if, we, if we have to standardize the method, we have to also make sure that it stays flexible because if we put meta barcoding, let's say, into practice for routine monitoring and we have it standardized, and then in three years later, we come up with an, this new method of whole genome sequence and say, well, this is now much more useful. The, the government offices and the, um, the offices doing the monitoring, they will be very angry probably to say, well, now we spend all this money and effort to standardize your old protocol and now you come up with a new one. So you have to figure out a way which, is, um, which means that it should stay flexible, which is a big part of Dean Aquanet. Also, if we look at um, the sorting procedure where we have to remove all the stones and leaves from those, um, those kick samples, currently there are also some tests which came out of uh, the Aquanet where we're saying like money-wise, it's much better if we can skip the sorting step because this is very time intensive. Can we find a way with DNA to skip the sorting and just maybe grind up everything together or for example, just filter, filter the ethanol for the sample because the ethanol should have DNA in it as well. Is it maybe enough to do, to do the assessment? So there's quite a lot of development in this field, a lot of the validation going on. But also, um, this is not set in stone. So even the method might be, in 10 years, might be replaced by something better. So this is really um, at a high pace at the moment. So I just wanted to um, alert you with that, that you're not confused if in five years nobody talks about meta barcoding anymore. But at the moment, meta barcoding is really the, um, the way to go. And I think for the next few years as well. But um, long term, there will be some, some new, even better, and more exciting stuff. So let's quickly recap. Um, we have quite some issues with meta barcoding, but the method works, and those issues are manageable. So we have, we talked about primer bias, which prevents you from getting um, any, any abundance data, so it's just present absence. And don't listen to those people who tell you about different markers and all the problems. You can design good primers, and you really have to do that, and you have to validate your primers, and then the method works actually quite well. You have this biomass issue where we could think about sorting our specimens so that the small ones don't get lost. The reference database is mostly complete. There are a few, uh, there are a few undescribed species and also conflicts between morphology and DNA, and this is where we really need the morphologists and taxonomists to. Um, to really look at those specimens again and, and figure out what, is the, what are the actual species. And also when we now can identify most, most things on species level, it's really up to, to people like Jay, for example, to figure out what, is, what are the, the ecological conditions that those species are thriving in or like maybe are not feeling very well. So basically, for example, with those mesocosm experiments, testing the effect of multiple stressors onto different species, that's very important research. That is very beneficial for, for those meta barcoding method and for a more accurate assessment in the future. Also, we have the bioinformatics and there's quite some, as well as in the lab method, quite some, some not, not a clear consensus on all the details in the method. Here we just need more validation and need to, to come to a consensus, which hopefully we'll do over time. And then the biggest concern in my opinion at the moment is like meta barcode isn't super expensive, but doing traditional assessment often is still the same cost or maybe even cheaper. And there's just that, that cost of meta barcoding has still to decline a bit. And, but this will, will do with cheaper sequencing and also with just scaling everything up. So if we do it in a large scale, this of course, economics of scale will make things cheaper as well. So I hope I um, convinced you with that, that meta barcoding is a very good option to do um, future assessment of microinvertebrates and also feel free to use it in any other research. But there, um, I hope you understand a little bit of, of the problems behind it because this is not many people talk about those issues and um, even less people really test their method uh, concerning those problems. So if you read a meta barcoding study, um, really 
double check if they accounted for those problems. So if they just pulled a meta bar coding protocol from somewhere and have thrown it on an ecological question. I mean, not everybody does it this way, but, but some people do, which um, gives me a headache sometimes. Mm -hmm. So with that, I would like to thank everybody involved and um, thank you a lot for, for listening. Thank you very much.